We're back for part two of this series. Last episode, we laid out some basic uh, basic outline of medicine practiced at the time of the Civil War, and also also Dark, Dr. Archibald S. Maxwell's uh, practice of medicine and the various roles that he that he held throughout the Civil War, and why talking about him allows us to talk about the practice of medicine during the Civil War. Um, we briefly discussed how the practice of medicine in the Civil War is quite different from the practice of medicine today. Uh, in this episode, we're going to discuss the Union Medical Corps, which was the U.S. Army Medical Corps that the Union inherited uh, at the start of the war. The U.S. Army was quite quite a bit different than the uh, the army that would eventually be built, the volunteer army that would eventually be built to save the Union in the Civil War by, by the North. Um, this is important. It's important to discuss the Medical Corps and its deficiencies because the, the Corps' dysfunction led civil society, regular society in the North and across all the, all the Union states, uh, to campaign for the creation of national and regional and state and local soldiers' aid societies or sanitary commissions. Um, and the sanitary commission was not about sanitation in, in the sense that we think about sanitation today. They weren't picking up um, garbage and, and that kind of thing. No, that's not what they were doing. Um, these were commissions that were engaged in attempting to provide additional medical supplies uh, and also personnel to supplement and make up for the deficiencies in the Union Army's Medical Corps. Um, I wanted to give you a heads up that I had originally, if you remember from part one, from, from the first series, I had suggested that we would also cover the battle, uh, the assistance provided after the Battle of Fort Donaldson. I've taken a look at, at the length of this second series and I've decided to break it into two halves. So the first half will talk about the rise of these national, regional um, uh, sanitary commissions, so, soldiers aid commissions, um, and the political rivalry, rivalry within, within Iowa um, uh, that, that arose during the uh, Governor Kirkwood administration. Uh, in 1861, 62, and 63, um, and uh, we will uh, leave the battle for Fort Donaldson for part two, okay? All right. The Medical Corps was organizationally designed for the small army that the U.S. had before the Civil War, and it was designed to be deployed at the regimental level with two surgeons, an assistant surgeon and a surgeon, um, who uh, by the 1840s had gained officer rank, captains and majors. Um, and the peacetime army was mainly deployed in forts across west in small detachments. And the surgeon and assistant surgeon duo allowed it to be deployed at, you know, to be deployed with the regiment um, and it ensured that a single regiment deployed or stationed uh, somewhere wherever it was had some sort had some form of medical care a doctor to take care of it or if the regiment was split up among multiple locations you at least had the possibility of having in a surgeon or assistant surgeon in, in one spot the Medical Corps, um, however, was just responsible for the assistant surgeons and the surgeons and their books and, and kind of the basics. Um, and uh, they relied on the Quartermaster Corps to provide um, everything necessary to set up their hospitals and to equip the hospitals and to provide supplies. And if there was a battle, you also relied on your quartermaster who had the wagons to transport the wounded from the battlefield. Um, 
However, so basically the U.S. Army really didn't have a professional corpsman, as we think of, somebody who was designated to run out and, and, and get wounded soldiers off the battlefield and take them back to the hospital. That really didn't exist. Um, quartermaster drivers uh, often were in the rear. Um, and, so, and they didn't, you know, Civil War, it would be determined in, during the Civil War, they weren't too much in a hurry to run forward and, and grab wounded people and risk life and limb. That wasn't what they were what they were hired for. They were hired to drive um, goods from one spot to another. And uh, that's why during the Civil War, uh, this co medical corpsman function would eventually be developed. However, now it's 1861 and that doesn't yet exist. Um, and so the medical corps was really built, was not built for a large scale army or also for addressing the kind of casualties that you would have um, in a very large battle, uh, particularly the kind of battles that the Civil War started to produce um, as you had larger field armies um, uh, fighting battles. The experience, in addition, at the beginning of the Civil War, the experience of the surgeons, the U.S. Civil, the U.S. surgeons for the Army, much of their experience came from practicing medicine on a windswept prairie in a fort. Um, they had a variety, therefore, of, of experiences. They'd seen a number of different things, but they hadn't seen enough uh, surgeries and, and so forth just because those kind of things didn't happen um, to be particularly specialized in, in some of the, those, those surgeries. Um, and the medical corps also had a very rigid culture where promotion was based on seniority and little had changed for many decades. It, it was um, it was led by uh, it was led by a surgeon Thomas Lawson, who was a veteran of the War of 1812, at the beginning of the Civil War. He was in the process of of of, of slowly dying, um, but. He had been the Surgeon General for a very long time. He'd been appointed in the John Quincy Adams administration, which was <laughs> uh, between 1824 and 1828. Uh, so he had he had run he had run things at uh, in the Surgeon General's uh, office for the Army for you know decades and that meant that you didn't see a lot of, of upward promotion um, and little had changed. His chief accomplishment as I say was in the 1840s when he was able to get officer rank for his surgeons um, and he stuck surgeons in various little prairie forts sometimes for a very long time um, and um, so what you saw was this kind of rigid organization that needed to rapidly develop and change as the new Union Army uh, was being built to prosecute the war. It wasn't until, and reform wouldn't come quickly, it wasn't until the first year of the war in April of 1862 that a reform bill would pass Congress and attempt at serious reform would take hold uh, and they would appoint a surgeon called Surgeon General Hammond who would, uh, who would initiate a number of, of different reforms. Um, and, and into this gap 
because so you, you so in 1861 you people knew that the medical corps uh, for the army wasn't going to be ready and wasn't going to get ready and um, civil society other doctors and uh, civil society and other interested people in civil society knew about that that it wasn't equal to the task and they stepped up to to try and fill in that gap um, civil society uh, basically started to form uh, a number of different soldiers relief organizations they also called them sanitary commissions um, very early on one of the largest and earliest organizations was the u.s sanitary commission which was founded in new york in the april to may 1861 time frame the original idea of the commission was that it would try to play a role similar to florence nightingale's sanitary commission in the recent crimean war where britain and france had, and and turkey had fought um, Russia in Crimea in the 1850s. Um, the U.S. Sanitary Commission first attempted to convince the Surgeon General. Uh, this would be the individual who was 80 some years old and a veteran of the War of 1812 uh, that the Medical Corps needed to accept their help. He he refused, um, and they then. Uh, once he had he had uh, stepped back because he was uh, he was sick and was dying, the new a new surgeon general was appointed, uh, a guy who uh, was almost nearly as old as he was, not quite, but it, based on seniority, right? So he'd been there for a very long time, many many years. He also wasn't interested, and so the organizers went around them and secured an order from the Secretary of War, Cameron, uh, to establish their official affiliation with the Union Army. Uh, and that happened in June of, of, of 1861. They then built out a national organization coordinating the collection of donations from local groups. Their idea was that uh, no matter where the Union soldier came from, if the Union soldier needed goods, the sanitary service would provide it. They took a very national approach, not a state by state approach. We'll discuss the, how that's a bit different from, from what other, the approach other organizations took. And it, but what it allowed to happen was there were different parts of the Union which were um, wealthier and their donations could then supplement other parts of the union which weren't quite as wealthy and didn't have as much to give um, their organization concentrated first on establishing itself on the eastern front it wasn't until uh, they sent Do uh, dr newberry uh, west of the appalachian mountains in september of, of 1861 by then, when he arrived in the west, west of the Appalachians, uh, he went down the Ohio and then went to St. Louis, Missouri. By then, there was a rival organization that had been set up called the Western Sanitary Commission. It was a friendly rivalry, but nonetheless a competition for individuals' donations and attention. Um, uh, everyone wanted their donations to go to their organization so that they could then take credit for it and do the distribution and make sure that their people got it. The Western Sanitary Commission, um, which is a, another sanitary commission, this rival one to the U.S. Sanitary Commission, was founded after the Battle of Wilson's Creek in August of 1861. And the, the, the uh, wounded from that battle made it back to St. Louis um, to be to seek treatment because in St. Louis there was a hospital that had recently been established. Unfortunately, the quartermaster and the medical corps 
hadn't bothered to provide anything in this hospital. It was four bare walls, no beds, no food, no bandages, no stoves, no bedding, no nurses. Um, and um, that was a that was pretty stark. And uh, the people of St. Louis rallied around. Um, uh, but you had wounded soldiers, wounded Union soldiers who la lay for days on, in their bloody, tattered, dirty uniforms on boards, because pardon me, beds in this hospital. The people of St. Louis organized. They provided food and other basics, beds and, and bandages and changes of clothes, those kind of things. And that eventually led to the creation of the Western Sanitary Commission. Um, and uh, that the commission was officially approved and, and created by General John C. Fremont, who was the commanding officer for that theater, who issued an order. He set out the, the scope with which the Western Sanitary Commission could act uh, and what their permitted activities were and their access to the, to the front and the and affiliation with the army. Uh, all that was done in September of 1861. So when Mr. Newberry finally shows up from the U.S. Sanitary Commission, makes it to St. Louis uh, in, in September, he, he basically asked, well, so are you going to work under me? And the Western Sanitary Commissioner said, um, and, and he pointed to his authority from the Secretary of War, Secretary Cameron, uh, thinking that somehow that that would mean that they would have to subordinate to him. Uh, uh, they declined to subordinate. Um, and instead, what they did was they decided to have an amicable split of geographic territory, which they generally respected. And this idea was the U.S. Sanitary Commission would be largely responsible for distribution of aid to soldiers east of the Mississippi River, and the Western Sanitary Commission would be responsible for aid distributed to soldiers west of the Mississippi River, with some give and take when things were along the Mississippi River. So that's two of the main national, regional soldiers aid uh, medical aid uh, organizations. The third one was founded slightly later. Um, it was called the Christian Commission. It arose from the Young Men's Christian Association movement, which had been a, a movement uh, that, uh, you know, a recent religious movement. And, and they founded their Christian Commission in 1861. It, it, at first, it wasn't founded to provide medical aid. It was instead founded to focus on administering to spiritual needs of the Union soldiers, distributing Bibles and pamphlets and, and the like. And it was mainly done by volunteer reverends, uh, ministers and, and, and other, uh, you know, other churchgoers. Um, it wasn't until mid to late 1862 that they began to change their focus and started to distribute medical aid to the front using their volunteer or, uh, organization. And, and honestly, the reason that they did that was they found there was a greater need and also that it was easier to solicit donations of goods and, 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 and money if it was going to go to medical aid to help out some wounded Union soldier. Um, and, and in 1864, Annie Whitmire, who was from Iowa, would um, start to work with them to provide what were called her special diet, kitch, diet kitchens for hospitalized Union soldiers. And those diet kitchens were um, designed to ensure that the wounded soldiers got nutritional, good nutritional meals um, that met their basic nutritional needs delivered in a way that they could eat it because it wasn't uncommon to have a scenario where the food could be served, particularly earlier in the war, the food that was provided um, 
wasn't done in a way that a, a sick man might be able to eat it. For instance, if he's unable, too weak to chew, for instance. Um, and so these diet kitchens were, were something that she came up with in late 1863 and then rolled out in 1864 with the help of the Christian Commission. But we'll get into that in more detail later. The forces that drove the creation of the U.S. Sanitary Commission and the Western Sanitary Commission and uh, at a regional and a national level also worked to drive the creation of similar groups at a state and local level. Now, in the state of Iowa, that led to the creation of a rivalry among two competing state level organizations and much of the reason for the creation of this rivalry rivalry had to do with a mistake made by governor kirkwood in the fall of 1861 and um and governor kirkwood was i was governor of the first half of the civil war he was a pretty good governor but um due to a, a you know, basically it was it was a mistake um he didn't choose to incorporate the pre-existing grassroots network which was created by the keokuk ladies aid society and was led mainly by women at various local city levels and 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 so forth he didn't incorporate them and 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 um that led to significant tensions uh throughout his the course of his rest of his term as governor when it came to the collection and distribution of medical aid and assistance to medic to iowa soldiers so the first group that arose at a state level was i call the keokuk ladies aid society network it was a loose organic grassroots effort started by different groups of women in their own towns and cities who were concerned for the welfare of Union soldiers. The face of this organization and their leader in the field was Mrs. Annie Whitmire. She had experience prior to the war, volunteer efforts related to the to children's education in Keokuk. And um, her husband and she were separated. Mr. Whitmire had moved further west to tend another store in a different town and had largely left Annie and their child um, in Keokuk. Uh, and, and that's why many books describe her as being a widow, although she wasn't. Um, and at the beginning of the war, uh, Iowa had most of its soldiers collect and gather at Keokuk where they would then board a steamer below the falls and head down to St. Louis or to wherever it was along the Mississippi River uh, in Missouri that, that the Union needed those soldiers. Miss Whitmire started visiting the camps very early on to care for the sick and the wounded. And then when the 2nd Iowa Regiment left for Missouri, she went along with it and she took careful notes of what medical supplies were available and what the needs were of each of the regimental soldiers, particularly ones that fell ill. And she would write back and ask for supplies so she could address those needs. The Keokuk Ladies Aid Society Network grew out of those calls of action, which she would get published in the newspaper or, or reach out to people. Um, and the Keokuk Ladies Aid Society itself was founded around the April-May time frame, same time as U.S. Sanitary Commission. And um, she gave her, her, uh, her, her largest first full year report in, in November 19th. Um, and she reported on the on-ground medical conditions and the needs of the many Iowa residents, uh, regiments that were stationed in Missouri. And it was clear that she had gone from one regimental hospital to another and, and understood what, what kind of the soldiers' needs were and had also come up with somewhat of a plan for how to try and address those. Um, 
and and her reports and also other reports that got back to back to Iowa uh, and including letters that got published in the newspaper from from soldiers that were serving in Missouri and the reports for how the wounded were treated and when they returned from the Battle of Wilson's Creek in St. Louis filtered their way back up to Iowa and created a lot of political pressure to do something about the lack of medical aid. That was because the, the U.S. Army just wasn't able to provide it. Plus, there were reports that transmissible diseases such as smallpox and measles and the like, uh, whooping cough and so forth, were, were running through uh, the soldiers who had, many of them had grown up on farms and rural areas where they were less exposed to those kind of diseases. And, um, and so this political pressure led uh, Governor Kirkwood in, in, on October 10th of 1861 to write a short letter to a up and coming Methodist Republican minister, Reverend A.J. Kynett, proposing that he try to create a state level organization to foster uh, the creation of other voluntary societies in towns where there weren't any yet, and also to coordinate the collection of aid from all societies, including ones that predated, where well, this would include, of course, the Keokuk Ladies Aid Society and their network. Within a few days, Reverend A.J. Kynette authored a return letter that proposed the creation of a new organization that he awkwardly titled the Iowa Army State Sanitary Commission, it could also be called the Iowa State Sanitary Commission, um, to manage this entire process, collect and pass the collected medical supplies along. Uh, and, and their initial idea was to pass them on to the, directly to the U.S. Sanitary Commission, which would then be in charge of redistributing them. A.J. Kynett's proposed commission had 13 prominent men, most of them Republicans, um, and many of these Republicans have played key roles in helping the governor earlier in the year and, and were continuing to help the governor in other areas to address the crisis of raising volunteer regiments and the crisis that had kind of befallen Iowa uh, with the beginning of the Civil War. Um, there were it had triggered many crises one of the fact that they that iowa had to try and equip all these regiments and didn't really have the supplies to do so um largely because uh they well largely because they were the western frontier and it was hard to get a hold of these supplies and also some of those supplies had been lent out by a prior governor um uh who who sought to support certain factions in the in the in the in the Kansas in the bloody Kansas uh, civil strife, um, and so these these individuals, including say for instance Hiram Price, who would eventually go on to become who was a local banker, who would go on to become a a, a congressman, Republican congressman. It also included one doctor. And only one, uh, Professor J.C. Hughes, who is a medical doctor from Keokuk, who taught at the Co Keokuk College for Physicians and Surgeons. Uh, but Professor Hugh, Dr. Hughes uh, had many hats at that time. He wasn't just uh, going to be the president of this organization. He was also uh, acting Surgeon General for Iowa, and he was head of the Keokuk Army Hospital. So um, he had a lot going on. The face of this organization would be the ambitious Methodist minister, uh, Reverend A.J. Kynette, who is its corresponding secretary. Um, and, and Reverend Kynette would be the face of the organization, publishing requests for donations, making speeches and organizing and helping uh, other people to organize. Um, and as I noted earlier, what this group didn't have was any women, any prominent women who, and many of these women had had already stepped up and were taking leadership roles in this effort to provide medical aid 
it was an area they thought they were very uh, attuned to um, and uh, because they had provided done so similar philanthropic activities in, in their local communities prior to the Civil War many sometimes through church groups um, and it didn't take long after in fact just about a month after uh, after Governor Kirkwood forms the Iowa Army State Sanitary Commission uh, the Keokuk Ladies Aid Society struck back uh, in a scathing editorial in the Keokuk Gate City newspaper that was published on November 18th, 1861. Uh, the society took issue with the fact that despite their several months of organization and earnest effort and work and their, you know, studying about the needs and, and attempts to collect and, and create an organization that they'd been totally ignored. Um, and that a bunch of guys, a bunch of men, who um, from their point of view uh, didn't know much more than they did, uh, they they kind of glossed over the fact that that um, Dr. Hughes had been appointed president um, of the organization, but they basically took note that nobody else in the organization was a doctor, and and they their view was that these these men wanted to swoop in uh, get a salary because this was a state appointed commission and so you would expect their expectation was that they would be paid something for their time unlike the Keokuk Ladies Aid Society where it was entirely volunteer right um, that these paid guys were going to run in steal the glory for their effort uh and and in their view the the Keokuk Ladies Aid Society's view was that these men had little aptitude for it and for what they were proposing to do um and so that hatched the rivalry so there was a rivalry there it was a rivalry partially for two reasons one is you had um, women who prior to the civil war particularly you know educated women from well or more well-to-do families um, and prior to the civil war it being the victorian era were uh, largely spent their time at home and you had women in the Civil War that were getting out into the public sphere and starting to define themselves in the public as leaders of organizations and to take on professions and do work outside of the home and um, this the Reverend Kynette in a way uh, and his group of, of men um, uh, represented uh, an attempt to um, make sure that men still had a prominent role and Governor Kirkwood had uh, I'll admit made a mistake in in not seeing that 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 the war and the dynamics that were driving it um, it being an all-encompassing war uh, that where all, the whole of society would get behind it would be one where women would need to take a more prominent role uh, and, and 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 step up. Um, so that that was at the heart of one of the rivalries. Okay, and and if you really wanted to read more about this discussion in more detail on this rivalry, you really should pick up uh, Professor Elizabeth Leonard's book called Yankee Women, where she talks about the this in, in greater detail than I can go into in in, in this video um, in addition there was a rivalry about how the medical aid supplies would be distributed and to be honest if if when you read the letters written by and the statements by uh, 
Mrs. Whitmire and the other ladies of the Keokuk Ladies Aid Society, this, if they had to pick, this was the real reason that they were out there to fight tooth and nail. Um, they did not like the plan for the Iowa Army State Sanitary Commission, which was to aggregate supplies, ship them off to the U.S. Sanitary Commission warehouse, and leave it up to the U.S. Sanitary Commission to decide what got sent to whom and and to where, uh, uh, you know, for the Iowa soldiers in the field. Annie Whitmire and the Keokuk Ladies Aid Society viewed the distribution of the particular supplies gathered to be particularly important to make sure that the Iowa soldiers benefited from the donations that they collected in Iowa. And they viewed that as an important driver in their ability to get more donations in the future because the reports back that people in their homes would get from their sons and brothers and fathers that this person from the Keokuk Ladies Aid Society dropped by while saw to them while they were at, at their bed, spent time at their bedside, gave them a pillow when the U.S. Uh, Union Army had none, gave them a change of, of underwear uh, when the U.S. Army was incapable of doing so, uh, made sure that they got fed a, a healthy meal. That was what they were looking for. It was that human touch at the end that was important to them and the plan the the the, the men's plan the iowa state army state sanitary commission's plan didn't involve having that as the back end that was supposed to be done by volunteers from the u.s sanitary commission and you know who were um not not necessarily iowa volunteers um and in her November 19th publication, she, you know, in, in, the, in the Gate City uh, newspaper for Keokuk, she goes into this in great detail with each regiment. As we will detail in later videos, by September of 1862, this rivalry between Annie Whitmire and Keokuk uh, and, and Reverend Kynat and, and their two organizations had reached a fever pitch. Uh, the governor and the legislature in a special session would create the Iowa State Sanitary Commission and would appoint Annie Whitmire as the Iowa State Sanitary Agent. Um, and basically what that did is it elevated the, the two competing rivals so that they were could both claim that they had some form of legitimacy. Uh, Reverend Kynette claimed his legitimacy from the from the appointment by the governor of Iowa by, on the governor's own authority. And um, Annie Whitmire would claim her authority based on state statute that had created her commission and given her the appointment. Um, unfortunately, the creation of this new Iowa State Sanitary Commission did not eliminate the rivalry during the Kirkwood administration, as I will go into, uh, go into greater detail in in, in later videos. So one of the first things that uh, the Iowa Army State Sanitary Commission did once it was established in October was it sent two of its representatives, Jason Lindley and George Parker of Missouri, uh, during the uh, last half of October of 1861 and all of November of 1861. Uh, to visit each rev regiment and compile a report on what was needed and note deficiencies. And because Governor Kirkwood and, and others um, were concerned that when Iowa had organized some of these regiments, that, the, they, that Iowa hadn't exactly provided either the right kind of firearm or other kinds of supplies. They also wanted them to check for that to see what additional supplies might need to, need to be gathered and, and provided. These representatives mainly uh, went from place to place and spoke to the commanding officers. This is in contrast to Mrs. Annie Whitmire, 
who spent a lot of time with the actual ordinary soldiers, uh, supervise, you know, seeing to their needs. And because they only interviewed officers and only got general impressions from these officers, their analysis of what was necessary was pretty superficial and their observations about um, lack of medical supplies and deficiencies was not very particular. I mean, they, they were told, um, uh, it's pretty obvious from the report that they were told that there were some deficiencies, but um, the kinds of deficiencies they, they didn't really put their pulse on. Um, and when they published their report, part of their report gets published in the Gazette, Davenport Gazette on November 30th, um, you'll, you would notice that it reads like a travel log. On this day in October, we went here, we met with this person uh, at this regiment with a few details and then on the next thing, um, quite superficial. Uh, they took note uh, on, on deficient firearms and other supplies, uh, like some, one of the regiments had been issued out of date muskets uh, and, and that kind of thing. Um, but it was just very, very general. Um, and then midway through their trip on November 7th of 1861, General Grant and 3,500 troops left uh, his headquarters in Cairo, boarded a boat, went down uh, Mississippi River to the Confederate position at Belmont, Missouri, which was on the opposite side from Columbus, Kentucky. And there you had the Battle of Belmont. Um, there were 120 Union soldiers killed and 390 Union, uh, wounded. Uh, when the battle happened, um, representatives, uh, the representatives of the Iowa State Army Sanitary Commission uh, and, and also I Annie Whitmire uh, appeared. Um, they, they got permission from Iowa General Curtis to go down to provide assistance in ensuring that Iowa dead were buried and, and also that the Iowa wounded were being cared for. Um, and the Battle of Belmont was kind of a, a trial run for what kind of things uh, the Union Army would need after a battle, obviously the wounded and 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 dead would were not on the scale of later battles to come in 1862. So, but if you compare the commission's report, which was produced in a multi-page document in January of 1862, against the two columns that Annie Whitmire wrote for the Gate City, uh, Gate City Keokuk newspaper on November 19th, um, it's easy to see who has better information on what a soldier's needs really are. Annie Whitmire is, has drilled down into and is already asking people for certain types of supplies, bedding, and 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 changes of underwear and and and, and certain types of food um, because uh, she was actually treating and seeing the soldiers at an individual level, whereas the commission's basic problem was it saw itself as kind of a uh, you know a check auditor. I, I went here talked to the commanding officer, commanding officer told me this, and then on they went. Um, and that kind of gloss um, doesn't really give you enough detail sometimes in order to uh, get a better impression of, of what the actual needs are. Um, and because they weren't doctors, and weren't in the medical profession and weren't getting their hands dirty, so to speak, uh, very much. Uh, they really didn't have a lot of experience to know what to look for. Um, they did know as a general matter that there was a severe deficiency in the medical supply area because you didn't, you know, it was so obvious. Um,
the commission would publish a report in January that detailed all of their findings from their trip uh, to Missouri in the uh, October, November timeframe. And in addition to that, in the back of the report, they listed all of the local Iowa State Sanitary Commissions and Soldiers Aid Societies in towns across Iowa that were cooperating with them. And this is an impressive list. It does not include the ones that were cooperating with the Keokuk Ladies Aid Society. But from this list, we can tell that many of these aid societies rose up at the, in the latter half of, of 1861 at the city level. Um, and this is a great example of ordinary people coming together to organize and contribute to an effort to remedy uh, this deficiency in medical supplies. Um, and it's quite amazing, actually. Um, you saw all, uh, many of these people, had, you know, their sons and brothers and fathers had gone off to volunteer in, uh, to fight in Iowa's regiments in the South, uh, down in Missouri for the Union. And they on the home front were picking up those tasks, you know, on the farm uh, that, uh, and, and trying to uh, make up for that. And in addition to that, they were also getting together in these, you know, local sanitary commissions to, to contribute again to the cause, right? To make sure that their uh, soldiers had the medical supplies that they needed. Um, it, it's quite an amazing effort. Uh, and uh, I've picked out a few. I happen to be from Central City, Iowa, so that's why Central City, Iowa is listed first. It was organized in December of 1861, and then Aunt Anamosa had one, Monticello, Delhi, Wyoming, Maquoketa, Vinton, Colesburg, Eddyville, DeWitt, Shell Rock. All, the, all these towns had organized um, sanitary commissions for groups of, of, of uh, individuals that got together and, and, and gathered supplies to contribute, to um, help, uh, the, help with this you know, grave need for medical supplies. Um, it's quite a long and detailed list. And one that Iowa and, and, and people in the North, one that Iowa should be proud of. Um, and so next time we will move to the second half of uh, when we'll discuss how this organization swung in to step up to address and provide aid for Grant's latest series of victories, much larger than the Battle of Belmont. And of course, what I'm speaking of is um, the, uh, the, the wounded Iowa soldiers uh, from the battles of, of Fort Henry, for Fort Henry and Fort Donaldson in Tennessee in February of 1862. Please remember to like or follow this series so that you'll get notifications when the next one comes out. And without further ado, I bid you farewell. And I look forward to seeing you all again when we talk about the medical aid provided in the aftermath of the Battle of Fort Donaldson.